Coomanias, Plants, Prifatio, Proimion, Introduction. We learned in Comanius the beginnings that Comanius was an eyewitness to the Copernican Revolution. We learned in Comanius Stones, Minerals, Metals that he was born soon after Georgius Agricola's works De Natura Fossilium and De Re Metallica had inaugurated a more scientific approach to mineralogy and metallurgy. As it happened, Comanius was also born after three quarters of a century of great advancements in the study of plants, and after the recent establishment of plant study as a university curriculum, though the field had not yet acquired the name botany. For those who are interested, we've created as an introduction to Comanius's chapters on plants another Prifatio, in fact, as it has turned out, a rather extensive history of the study of plants, from antiquity through the Renaissance to Comanius's time, then to Linnaeus and beyond. This video is a brief introduction. Let's locate ourselves on the great chain of being, or Scala Naturae, which is to say, let's see where we are at this point in Comanius. So far, we've contemplated the cosmos and then stubbed our toes on Earth's surface. We shall now begin reascending the chain or ladder to animate life. What is animate life? Of his three kingdoms of nature, the naturalist Carl Linnaeus famously wrote, Lapides crescunt, vegetabilia crescunt et vivunt, animalia crescunt vivunt et sentient. There's a number of questions we could ask about this. Lapides Crescunt? What did Linnaeus mean that stones grow? We've already touched on that in Comanius, Stones, Minerals, Metals. Linnaeus says plants don't feel, vegetabilia non sentient. Are you confident that this is true? What about these two plants from the family Fabaceae, the shy mimosa and the telegraph plant? The shy mimosa, or touch-me-not, is observably sensitive to our touch. And the telegraph plant is sure dancing around, or gyrating, as in its former scientific name, Desmodium gyrans, the gyrating Desmodium. But why? Charles Darwin put a lot of study into this plant, and he wrote about it in one of his last publications, The Power of Movement in Plants. What he was researching was phototropism, the sensitivity of plants to light. Num vegetabilia non sentient? Note that in both the Prifatio II and in the chapters on plants in Comenius, we'll often be giving the current taxonomical classification and nomenclature of the plants we illustrate. If you've taken a biology class, you may know the mnemonic saying, King Philip came over for good spaghetti. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. The shy mimosa, for example, is a species within the genus mimosa, within the family Fabaceae. Linnaeus, as conventionally indicated by the L after the binomial name, gave this plant its scientific name mimosa pudica, the bashful mimosa. But most of us, unless we're professional botanists, don't go around saying, oh, look, there is a mimosa pudica. We use common names that are usually locale-specific, often quite charming, and often packing a lot of interesting history. The taxonomic situation is more complicated with the telegraph plant, also known as beggarweed, a perfect example of a charming and intriguing name for a plant. The currently accepted scientific name is the mouthful Codariocalyx motorius, the moving Codariocalyx. As shown in the table, this name was first suggested by Martin Houghton, a contemporary of Linnaeus's, but only made official by the Japanese botanist Hiroyoshi Ohashi in the 20th century. 
Before that, it had been named the Hedesarum Girons by Linnaeus's son, Linnae Filius, L.F., and also Desmodium Girons, a name also suggested by the younger Linnaeus, but made authoritative in the generation after Linnaeus by the famous French botanist Augustin Pyramus de Condol, abbreviated D.C., the scientific names and their author citations are governed by the International Code of Nomenclature for Algae, Fungi, and Plants, or ICN. For our purposes, we'll generally only indicate whether or not the name came from Linnaeus. We've already used the word taxonomy, and we'll be using it so often that we should give it a definition. The word was coined by Augustin Pyramus de Candolle, in his 1813 book, Théorie élémentaire de la botanique, is an irregular formation from hetaxis, arrangement, and nomia, from Greek nomos, nemane. Taxonomy studies taxa. Taxa are groups of organisms thought to be closely related and selected for study. Taxon singular, taxa plural, was a back formation in the 1920s from the already coined word taxonomy. The discipline of taxonomy has been defined as consisting of four components, description, identification, nomenclature, and classification, or DINC. The word systematics is sometimes treated as a synonym of taxonomy, but systematics focuses on the evolutionary relationship of species, known as phylogenetics, rather than their classification in the traditional rank-based scheme, kingdom, phylum, class, etc. To see taxonomy and systematics juxtaposed, here is the complete scientific classification of the telegraph plant from Wikipedia. Taxonomically, Codariocalyx motorius is a species in the genus Codariocalyx, which is in the family Fabaceae, which is in the order Fabales, which is, of course, within the kingdom Plantae. But from the perspective of phylogenetics, that is, from the perspective of plant evolution, the Codariocalyx motorius belongs to the clade or monophyletic group called Rosids within the clade of eudicots, within the clade of flowering plants, the angiosperms or magnolia futa. This will all be explained. The relationship of nomenclature to knowledge, by the way, has an ancient pedigree. Antisthenes, a disciple of Socrates, later considered to be the founder of the Cynic school of philosophy, said archaesopias onomaton episkepsis. The beginning of knowledge is the examination of names. And nomenclature is, of course, what Comenius is all about. Remember the introduction? Totius enum eruditionis posuit fundamenta, qui nomenclaturum naturae et artis per diricit. Hogar toemathon tentes puse osta caetes tecnes onomatotesion, ha passes paideas crepida calos hypetican. But it turns out identifying a plant and naming it effectively, that is, with a description or name by which my friend in Brazil and I will mean the exact same plant, and classifying plants accurately, that is, establishing relationships among them on a sound scientific basis, is not easy. The fascinating history of that endeavor in the Western world is what this preface to Comenius Plants is all about. In English, there's a bunch of things we collectively call plants. How is this collective notion expressed in Greek and Latin? The Greek is easy. They used ta puta, meaning growths, from puomai, to grow. The Romans don't seem to have had a collective term for plants. Cicero, for example, when distinguishing plants collectively from animals, used a circumlocution, res quae gignuntur etera. Pliny wrote extensively, as we'll see, about crops, herbs, fruits, trees, etc., 
but for plants as a whole, he also used phrases like terra e nascentia. In classical Latin, planta meant one, a shoot detached from a parent plant for purposes of propagation, or two, a young plant or seedling. As a collective term for plants, plantae only started appearing about a century before Comenius. Besides plantae, Renaissance and post-Renaissance writers who wrote about plants in Latin favored herbi, or stirpes. For his plant kingdom, Linnaeus rejected these terms and preferred vegetabilia. Vegetabilis was a late Latin word from vegetus and vegeo that meant animating, enlivening, and later growing, flourishing. From vegetabilis via Old French, we got English vegetable, which in English was also originally a collective term for plants, its first use more particularly as a healthy herb or root from the garden, as in eat your vegetables, is first attested according to the Oxford English Dictionary in 1767. Another word for plant in ancient Greek was botane. He botane in Homer and classical Greek meant pasture and fodder. In Hellenistic Greek and beyond it came to mean herb or weed. The adjective botanikos then meant relating to plants or herbs. So, for example, in a text we will be reading, the great herbalist Dioscorides referred to the tradition of Greek literature on herbal remedies, ta botanica parmaca, as he botanicae paradosis. The great English botanist John Ray is credited with resurrecting this Greek term and giving the name botany to the scientific study of plants at the beginning of the 18th century. I mentioned Dioscorides. As you might imagine, the Greeks were the first serious students of plants. When we say the Greeks, we mean, for the most part, three writers, Theophrastus, Pliny the Elder, and Pedanius Dioscorides. Pliny, you may know, was a Roman, and when we get to him, I'll explain why some, what jokingly I call him a Greek. We have already encountered these three in Comenius, Stones, Minerals, Metals, since they were all students, albeit for very different purposes, of all three branches of natural history, mineralogy, botany, and zoology. Besides their role in the history of science, they obviously contribute a great deal to the Greek and Latin vocabulary for plants, and we're going to begin with a rather extensive look at Theophrastus, Pliny, and Dioscorides. But before diving into Theophrastus, I want to acknowledge a few resources I have especially relied on. For early botanical history, and especially his chapter on Theophrastus, I have made special use of Edward Lee Green's 1909 monograph for the Smithsonian Institute, which you can find on Google Books. I have immensely enjoyed Anna Pavord's account of the search for order among plants from Theophrastus through John Ray in her work originally titled The Naming of Names and then renamed Searching for Order, the history of the alchemists, herbalists, and philosophers who unlocked the secrets of the plant world. For the contemporary field of botany, other than the web and Wikipedia in particular, I have relied on the 2010 edition of Plant Systematics by Michael G. Simpson. If you're not in the mood for a textbook, try Carol Kaisuk Yoon's Naming Nature. Ms. Yoon has a PhD in evolutionary biology from Cornell, and she witnessed up close how traditional Linnaean taxonomy was mercilessly overthrown in the 1990s by phylogenetic systematics, or what you will learn to call cladistics. For her, it was an upsetting experience, and she wrote this book about what she calls the clash between instinct, the way the human brain seems to be wired to perceive the relationship between things in nature, and science. Finally, in Comenius Plants, you'll be learning lots of Latin and Greek names for plants and types of plants and parts of plants. 
If this is a garden you have any interest in cultivating further, you will find William T. Stern indispensable. In fact, when we get to Linnaeus in the Praefatio, we will have more to say about this very peculiar branch of Latin called Botanical Latin. And unless you are already fairly well educated in botany, you will probably need some help with the English names botanists use for plant parts, most of which, as it turns out, are simply botanical Latin terms without the Latin case endings. For this purpose, I have found the illustrated glossary of James and Melinda Harris also virtually indispensable.